From New York City for our viewers worldwide, I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrow. Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Coming up, rising virus cases forcing Wall Street to rethink the economic growth outlook. As 10-year yields search for direction after sliding for five straight sessions, setting up markets for the Fed's next move, with investors looking ahead to Jackson Hole. Let's begin with the big issue, mounting headwinds weighing on the recovery outlook. We're really questioning the economic outlook in the, in the rates market. There have been a little bit of... Uh growth wobbles. Treasuries, I think, are pricing in this growth fear. There appears to be this sort of wall of worry. Cracks in the global recovery story. A lot of it has to do with what we're seeing with the Delta virus cases. Certainly, um, the Delta virus has thrown a wrench into um, into this recovery. How that's translated through into some high-frequency data. Does the Delta variant make that growth moderation much more than just moderation? There are reasons to be a little bit concerned. Joining us now, Greg Staples of WS Group, Invesco's Matt Brill and Brian Railing of Wells Fargo. So right now, let's figure out what we're looking at in terms of a growth slowdown and in terms of what potential we potentially were priced in. Greg, let's start with you. What's your sense of what the market is saying when it comes to just how much of a slowdown Delta and the variant there uh, could be introducing? We do see that there's going to be a bit of a slowdown. You know, we saw retail sales earlier this week be a little bit disappointing, but it was more interesting to just see the shift between uh, consumption goods versus service. There was some growth in service, and what's going on now is that the recovery is pivoting from consumption of goods to consumption of services. And let's face it, if COVID uh, raises up a little bit and it keeps people away from restaurants, from shopping in, 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 in malls, it means that the service part of the economy growth is going to slow down a little bit, maybe two-tenths of 1%. Nothing to really stop the recovery, but it is going to slow it down. Matt, what is your sense of what we're looking at in terms of what's being priced in and in terms of what the potential is on the heels of the variant? Yeah, good afternoon, Lisa. I, I would say that the market had already been slowing or the, the data had already been slowing before the, the Delta variant really started to pick up. And this has really just kind of accelerated things or really put a pause in terms of economic activity. You know, we were sort of anticipating things would kind of come off the sugar high. And then all of a sudden, the last week, everything's really come to a stop. I mean, if you look at concert tickets, sporting events, no one wants to go to anything this weekend. People just want to figure out where is this headed? What do I need to do? And then we'll figure out that, uh, you know, where we go from there later. So near term, this is definitely impediment. But if you look at the data, it's still an unvaccinated problem. And that makes me feel very good from a risk on trade standpoint. What's your sense, Brian, in terms of the slowdown and the potential here? Yeah, I concur. I mean, the, the bond market, basically, yield curve started flattening uh, back in May already. Um, suggesting there may be some uh, roadblocks ahead. But our expectation is that we're going to power through it here, at least in the U.S. I don't expect any wide-scale uh, closures. Uh, and I do think uh, that the re recovery continues. So perhaps the bond market's uh, a little bit bearish here compared to our uh, economic outlook. All right. Well, there's also a question of how the Fed will potentially respond to these renewed variants. I'll give you a sense of what Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan had to say earlier today, talking about the response of the Fed to uh, the renewed virus concerns. Take a listen. If I saw that the Delta variant was going to be persistent enough or unfold differently, say, than it has in other countries, UK or India, and, and be more challenging to where it starts to affect demand, I've got to take that into account and will uh, adjust my views accordingly. So, Brian, just to sort of pick up on what you were saying, where you were saying that you think that perhaps the market is a little overly cautious when it comes to how significant this will be, will the Fed also be overly cautious when it comes to delaying its taper? Well, I think at this point, they just continue down the path they've already laid out. Uh, I mean, they're not making an announcement uh, at Jackson Hole, uh, most likely at the September meeting. So uh, no reason to deviate uh, from the path they've laid out. But um, they have some flexibility. So, yes, if things uh, worsen between now and September, uh, we could potentially see them uh, delay that. But that's not our expectations at this point. Matt, what about you? I mean, how much will that reaction function blunt any effect by the variant, by the prolonged pandemic? So, so I think they will hold off. I think they, they, I think they have to, to be honest. I think the Fed um, is a little bit uh, prematurely declaring victory if they think that they can start to taper already. Um, you know, you we're seeing the, econo the economy slow down. And I, I really think from the Fed standpoint, a few extra months isn't going to hurt them. 
Um, I think it can really give him a lot better clarity. And, and Kaplan pivoting that quickly, to me, shows you that, that he's already realized this. I mean, that was a month ago that these notes came out. They really did want to taper, and they were on that path. But the world has changed. It's changed a lot in the last week. Well, and Greg, picking up on that, the fact that Robert Kaplan, who probably was the most hawkish among Dover and Dovish uh, Fed chairs, uh, really highlights the shift in sentiment and how little it will take to tip the margins. How significant is it that you have some of these more hawkish members changing their tone in terms of the Fed's reaction function? I think his voice is one among many. We've heard other Fed governors talking about uh, maybe even pulling forward, given the unemployment uh, data that we saw earlier this month. I think the ta tapering is very much on the, in the cards. It will begin right around year end. It would take a very major event to derail it. I think longer term, Powell wants to get to do the tapering. The window is open. I don't think he wants to wait until it is more potentially disruptive. But at the end of the day, I don't think tapering really is going to be impacting the market that much. The, all the short end liquidity that's being created by this is just going right back to the Fed and reverse repo. There's no place for this liquidity to go. And in the long end, it's really a bid for duration. But as the Fed a Treasury issuance declines a little bit at year end, you're going to see the offsetting uh, Treasury issuance. So it's not much that not that much disruptive on that end as well. So I think he's going to open, uh, take advantage of the open window right now and go through it. It would take a major, major effort to. Uh, to derail that script. Matt, if the Fed were to announce that they would begin tapering their bond purchases by the end of the year, what would the response be in terms of 10-year Treasury yields? Do they go up or do they go down? <laughs> yeah, that's that's definitely the trillion-dollar question. I mean, I, I think, honestly, I think they, they would go down because I think the market, um, depending on what happens with the Delta variant over the next few weeks, but it, it certainly looks to me if the Fed were to move early that, that it's going to put us, you know, more potentially into a, into a recession or at least a slower growth period. So I, I'm still very optimistic because I actually think the Fed is going to be extremely accommodative. If they announce it and they announce that they're only going to do you know, something like 10 billion less per month, that's no big deal. But the, the, the idea of them getting through tapering the first half of, of 2022, I think would be a huge mistake. And I think that would send yields lower. Brian, what's your sense? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think uh, there's a couple thing, uh, things you need to look at. First, how's the economy doing? If the economy is kind of powering through, it's strong, uh, and uh, the Fed tapers. I don't anticipate um, uh, much of a, uh, a yield impact. In fact, yields could rise a little bit. But however, if the economy is uh, starting to weaken, uh, Delta becomes a bigger concern and the Fed goes ahead and tapers, well, uh, yeah, then uh, clearly I think uh, yields had lower for there. So I kind of have to look at both pieces of the equation, I think. Greg, you were talking about how there it's very little that the uh, monthly bond purchases are actually doing at this point based on the disruptions that we're seeing in the money market accounts and the sort of recycling of money. So on the margins, what benefit would it have? And I realize this is somewhat of a philosophical question. What benefit does it have for the Fed to continue with its monthly bond purchases, given the fact that it seems to not really be being, being uh, effective at uh, giving some sort of boost to the employment market. At the end of the day, it really does have little in terms of the effect on the marketplace itself. It's more of the signaling effect. And if the question is, what does tapering do to, to yields? I think you're confusing cause with effect. I think if the Fed uh, does pull back on their tapering schedule, it's going to be because they see significant slowing within the economy. And it's going to be that significant slowing that's going to uh, bring rates down uh, overall in the marketplace. It's not the tapering per se that would do that. So let's make sure we get the causality right. All right. And then if the Fed does taper, there's also a question of the reaction function when it comes to credit. And Matt, I do want to sort of just finish on this topic, this question of how much it diminishes the appetite for riskiest securities that have enjoyed such an incredible boom so far uh, until a couple of weeks ago. Well, yeah, as you pump a lot of liquidity into the market, it, it forces people out the risk spectrum. So that means taking on more IG risk rather than treasuries, more high yield risk rather than IG, and then eventually more equities rather than bonds in general. So, you know, I think if the Fed were to pull back, um, again, if they do it aggressively, I, I think that that has to be a negative signal to, to risk markets. But my, my base view is that the, the Fed is going to be very, very slow in the way that they, they, they roll out the taper. Brian, final thought? Yeah, I mean, on the credit side, I mean, regardless of what the Fed does, there's tons of liquidity. Um, you know, it will continue to perform. It will continue to uh, uh, have flows. Uh, the big risk there is some type of event, some type of unknown event. If Delta becomes a bigger concern than our expectations are, uh, well, then, of course, credit could take it on the chin. But um, outside of that, uh, I don't think uh, taper has uh, much of an impact.
All right, well, all of you are sticking with us. Coming up, we'll take a look at just this flow. Global investors pouring into U.S. corporate debt as hedging costs tumble. We'll talk about that next. This is Bloomberg. I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. Time now for the auction block where we kick things off in Asia with dollar bond sales picking up as borrowers lock in low rates. Chinese tech giant Baidu headlining the spike in issuance with a $1 billion two-part sustainability deal. Foreign demand for U.S. high-grade debt fueling the action earlier in the week with investors piling in ahead of a season lull despite total sales misting estimates. And the junk bond rally losing momentum with issuers offering higher interest rates to lure investors and shelving deals entirely amid weak demand. Still with us, we are very lucky to have Greg Staples, Matt Brill, and Brian Rayling. And one thing that I found really interesting about this week is actually an underperformance of investment-grade bonds, especially given the fact that, you know, this seems to have been a sweet spot, not only domestically, but internationally. Brian, what's your sense of the meaning behind the underperformance of newly sold investment grade bonds? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of a surprise to me as well. Uh, I think the market is still relatively healthy. I think there's a, a demand there. Um, so I would expect the, the lull to be temporary. Uh, probably some concerns uh, just about uh, the risk appetite with Delta, et cetera. But Again, our expectation is, at least here in the U.S., we'll, we'll power through those. It won't be as big of a hit as, um, as uh, some are concerned about. Brian, just to follow up, in other words, do you think that this is a buying opportunity to sense that there's a little bit yeah. more skepticism? Yeah, I agree. I do think it's a buying yeah, you know, opportunity. Listen. Yep. Were you, uh, Greg, uh, um, were you Sorry. weighing in to figure out? Greg? Yeah, weighing in. It's listen. It's, it's the third week in a very slow August. I think flows or a lot of the professional investors are are on vacation. I wouldn't read too much into uh, into the kind of movement that you're seeing this week or last week, even in the high yield market, which is another story. I think overall the trend is still positive. So, what would you do with the action, uh, given that people it might be an opportunity for some? Truth be told, I think it is an opportunity, but I also would say that uh, we're expecting to see a pickup in issuance after we get past the Labor Day holidays. We're in a bit of a lull now. There's not too much going on in the marketplace, not too much issuance, but we think if you wait until after Labor Day, there will be issuance and even better opportunities then. All right, Matt, what do you make of the weakness that we've seen on the margins in certain aspects of credit? Yeah, yeah, I think Greg nailed it. I mean, I think right now a lot of the streets out on their two weekers. Um, you really kind of have a, you know that there's going to be a big calendar in September. We're expecting about $150 billion dollars of investment grade issuance, you're gonna get about $40 billion of high yield issuance. So the mindset for our desk right now is just let's wait and see what comes next week or in two weeks. Um, we're, we're really stockpiling liquidity. We're geared up hoping that there will be concessions in these new deals that we can take advantage of. Because we have backed up about 10 basis points in investment grade, 50 basis points in high yield. So we do think this is starting to become a buying opportunity. But usually you're better off waiting for the new issue market to do it rather than the secondary market. Matt, this is interesting to me. Why is that, especially at a time where it seems like companies are borrowing just because they can? They're borrowing for doing anything that they want under the sun, whether it's buying back shares, whether it's paying executives dividends, whatever you want to do. So why do you think that currently issued debt is going to be a better opportunity than existing notes? Well, usually it's just because of the liquidity that you can get after the fact, but generally there is a concession. You know, what we find in a lot of these deals at first is everybody uses all their money and they, they run out of dry powder about the first or second week into September, and then the concessions have to get bigger and bigger. So, you know, in that, in that regard, we think that the concessions might be 10, 15 basis points at that time, which can make up for, you know, some of the management indiscretion that might be <laughs> what, is, what is bringing the, the, these bonds in the first place. We're not too worried about defaults. We're not too worried about companies, you know, doing anything too um, outlandish, but there certainly is some 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 pickup of uh, of, de of debt that's being issued simply for uh, for dividends and, and some M and A as well. Which raises a question, Brian. When do you start to get concerned about the really easy borrowing conditions and really low yields for the investors? In other words, the deck is kind of stacked against people who want income, and we understand that the Fed's sticking their thumb on the whole situation. But at what point does it become concerning? Well, I mean, we've been in this situation for uh, quite some time. I don't see it going anywhere. So, um, you know, I think people have to reset uh, their yield expectations. Uh, I know we're going to have a little bit of uh, an inflation pickup, which concerns some fixed income investors. But again, I think that's temporary. Um, I just don't see a spike in, in interest rates coming uh, anytime soon. So, um, you know, I think you just got to allocate to your portfolio 
uh, you got to own what you got to own. And I, I wouldn't be sitting around waiting for significantly higher yields um, uh, to enter the market. Okay, so Greg, weigh in here because on one hand, I hear what everybody says, which is you're not going to see a default cycle the way that you have perhaps in the past. And certainly if you do, it's not going to be anytime soon. Yields are going to stay pretty low. Inflation seems somewhat contained. It's what this is the common line. So you can own credit. And even if the some of the, uh, the purposes for the cash are nah, not great, go for it anyway. When do you start to get concerned or do you just basically go with it? Because frankly, it's worked for more than a decade. I mean, overall, in terms of general themes, you're absolutely right. But what's interesting, and particularly, say, in the high-yield market, and we'll probably spill over into the IG market, is up to now, it's been a bit of a marketplace where you buy anything and it works. So, you know, the, the good, the bad, the indifferent, they all seem to perform quite well. But now what we're seeing in the high-yield market is a little bit of differentiation, which is good. There are some, some businesses out there that were able to get funded, and they, I don't think their long-term business plans are really going to be successful. They've taken advantage of the marketplace opportunities, and they've gotten some funding. But longer term, you really wonder where they're going to survive. And I think... Now it's really a time when security selection, doing your homework and credit makes a difference. And over time, that's going to differentiate the outperformers from the underperformers. Greg, do you think that the market is still a full market where people are actually doing price discovery to determine fundamentals? I think so. There's, there's still that, but I'm, I'm happy to see that there's some differentiation going on. It's a fully priced market. Listen, all of the securities markets are fully priced, whether you're in equity, whether you're in debt. Well, I think we all recognize that, and I don't see anything that's going to change it anytime soon, as long as the fundamentals for the economy stay strong. But uh, you want to prepare yourself for those potential downturns. Matt, do you see enough discretion to give, give you some comfort? Uh, you know, I, I do on the margin. I think one of the things I would point out is that, yes, valuations are tight, but you actually have seen corporate credit get better from a fundamental standpoint in the last 18 months. So um, the numbers that have been coming in on the second quarter 2021 earnings have actually gotten to the point where financial leverage is better than it was in the fourth quarter of 2019. So that's the first time we've been able to say that. And that's a great thing because all throughout 2020, we talked about the $1.8 trillion of issuance and all the debt that was being borrowed. Well, they've actually gotten to the point where they've grown their way out of it and paid down some debt. So we're in a much better, much better spot in that regard. But there will certainly be some, some bad apples that we're going to have to screen for. Brian, final word. No, listen, I think uh, the market um, for over a year now, um, you know, and will continue going forward is just driven on liquidity. I mean, that's the most important factor. Uh, the Fed tapering a little bit, um, you know, I don't think that uh, upsets the liquidity picture. So as long as liquidity remains, uh, you know, people got to buy something and, uh, you, know, um, you know, they're just flooding in uh, to all assets. Yeah, I just hear Tina going, uh, chanting over and over again, Tina, Tina. Everyone's sticking with us. Still ahead, we've got the final spread the week ahead featuring US PMI data and the Fed's Jackson Hole Symposium. That conversation coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Time now for the final spread. The week ahead, coming up next week, the White House are returning, the House of Representatives returning for summer recess on Monday. Plus, we get US PMIs, the Fed kicking off its annual Jackson Hole Symposium on Thursday. And we will hear from Chair Powell and personal spending and income numbers closing out the week on Friday. Greg Staples, Matt Brill, and Brian Rayling still with us. Does data matter anymore? That is a key question that I keep looking at as people look past each data point and they give some reason for why it is outdated and thus irrelevant. Matt, what data point going forward is going to be the most important for you in determining the path of yields? So to me, it's all about jobs and, and over the near term, it's all about hospitalization. So those are the things you need to watch for. Um, if jobs continue to print at you know, 600, 700,000, yeah, you know, we're, we're going to be in really good shape. The Fed will eventually taper. That's great for the economy. But if you see this hospitalizations, you know, you're talking about a lot of places at 70, 80, 90 percent, um, you know, uh, occupied. Um, that's not that's that's not a traditional data point we look for in economics. But that's one I think you have to look at right now. All right. Ryan, what about you? Yeah, I would say I'm most focused kind of on jobs and, and the economy. Um, you know, there's lots of um, uh, temporary disruptions and supply chains, et cetera, which uh, distort inflation and some of the other data bond investors would typically look at. But uh, the economic picture, the jobs picture, I think most important. All right, Greg? I'd look at the intersection of jobs and inflations. In other words, we're looking for average hourly earnings with the employment data. We're looking at the ECI numbers. 
We're looking at the subcomposition of the of the data. One thing that was really strong in that last number was that the unemployment rate for Black Americans fell by a full percentage point. Hispanics almost as much. That to me is uh, is what Powell is looking for and substantial further progress. So we'll look for numbers right. like that. Well, right now it's the time for everyone's favorite part of the show. It is time for rapid fire. Three quick questions, three quick answers. The first one. You might want to answer for longer. You are not able to. When the Fed announces it's planning to start tapering monthly bond purchases, will long-term rates rise or fall in response? Greg? I'd say they rise. Matt? i say they rise because it's going to be a while from now. Brian? A uh, rise. All right. Next question. European or U.S. investment-grade corporate bonds? Which one do you prefer? I'm going to start with you, Brian. A U.S. Matt? U.S., but Europe's bulletproof with the ECB buying. <laughs> Greg? <laughs> yeah, it's probably U.S., if nothing else, because the opportunity set is so much bigger. Okay, next one. Chinese bonds, buy or sell? I'm going to start with you on Matt. Buy quality. Buy quality Chinese bonds. Brian? Yes. Uh, tread carefully, so yes, buy quality yeah, if you're going to buy. Okay, there. Greg? Same thing, buy quality. So, but stay in China. All of you agree that you have to stay in China at this point, yep. even though it is a bit concerning. Well, my thank you to all of you. Have a wonderful weekend. Greg Staples, Matt Brill, and Brian Rayling. It has been a long and very tiring week as we go through the gyrations of growth scare to a uh, potential taper discussion. We will continue the discussion next week. We have, of course, Jackson Hole coming up on Friday. Bloomberg Surveillance will be bringing to it to you live on Friday when Fed Chair Jay Powell does give that speech. From New York, that does it for us. We will see you again next Friday at 1 p.m. New York time, 6 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg Real Yield, and this is Bloomberg Television.